everybody. If you are just tuning in, we're going to get started in, in just a second, but I have to invite my friend Sarah to join us. So let me invite my friend Sarah from the National Wildlife Federation. Okay. Hi, everyone. So we're going to get started in like just one second. I'm waiting for my friend Sarah from National Wildlife Federation. She's going to join us today. Oh, hey, Emily. <laughs> Hi there. How are you? <laughs> Doing well. How are you? I'm good. Um, so thank you for, for joining today. Um, I'm so excited to talk to you more about the toolkit and why we created it and, and all of the amazing work that's happening around outdoor learning. Um, so why don't we give our friends that are tuning in what's in Joe. Um, so I'm Kristen Fields. I'm the director of the School Gardens Program. Thank you, everybody who's waving and sending hearts. So it is the best way to make us feel comfortable. Thank you. <laughs> and um, we help schools start gardens, and I'm also here today with Sarah from National Wildlife Federation, and they do amazing work surrounding pollinator gardens in New York City, so many of you may know Sarah, too, already. And we're here today because we're going to talk about the resource gap and how we make a more equitable system to outdoor learning. But before we get into that, we just wanted to give you a little bit of background around why this work is so important and how it came to be. So Sarah and I have been doing this work for many years. Our programs have been doing this work for many years, but back, let's back up in time to like earlier this school year when we were thinking like, how do we reopen school safely now that there's COVID-19? And it really quickly became clear that there was a national push for outdoor learning. And I think we have all seen that picture from like 1918 when there was this, Spanish influenza and there were students learning outside under the Sarah you've seen that picture right like students yeah. learning outside under mm -hmm. the tent. yeah and people started to ask like is that what we should be doing here and so um, as like national efforts were pushing forward and there were resources that were being developed at the national level for moving kids to outdoor learning um Grow NYC and National Wildlife Federation, our two organizations felt like this is amazing. Let's support this. But New York City is like its own thing. So we came up with what we call the toolkit, the outdoor learning toolkit. And it's all our best like tips and tricks for setting up outdoor classrooms or outdoor learning and like how do you find resources and just how do you do this? Um, and so we published the toolkit in November and um, it's been amazing to see people implement it. But uh, Sarah, you wanna talk about like how many people opted in? Cause I mean, that, that's kind of amazing. Like, Yeah, yeah. I wanna just give a little bit, sort of remind everybody of that, that time period way back in September <laughs> of 2020 is that there was a lot of fear and there was a lot of anxiety. There still is of course, right? About the pandemic, but especially about um, reopening schools and what that would look like for students and teachers to go back back into a school building. So we, as seasoned environmental educators, we knew that spending out, spending time outdoors was safer because you're left, the virus is less transmittable. Um, you have fresh air and sun to boost the immune system and that you're just spending less time in front of a screen. So there, we knew there were health and safety reasons to spend more time outdoors. So that was also like a big push um, to publish the, the outdoor learning toolkit. So um, we did work with dozens, about a dozen other environmental education nonprofits in New York City to be able to put this together. And so um, I just want to kind of like bring that context into into play for this conversation now too. And so once we had all these conversations and we published the toolkit, the department, the New York City Department of Education did initiate um, an outdoor learning policy. So this was something that um, they agreed was was good for schools yeah. for them to have outdoor learning plans or to be able to set up spaces for outdoor instruction. And so 
once they initiated that um, that permitting process so that schools could set up places for instruction on their school grounds, they could also close off streets if they wanted to, and they could also um, get permits to use local parks or community gardens as outdoor classroom spaces as well. Once they um, set that up, over 900 schools opted into this program. So there's about 1800 schools in New York City and um, so 900 of them wanted to do this at their schools. Um, but as we were, you know, sort of publishing, as we were promoting the toolkit or trying to support schools and setting up these spaces, we knew there are a lot of reasons still that schools couldn't do this themselves. There are a lot of, there was a big resource gap for schools that um, for those other 900 schools that did not apply for these permits for outdoor learning. I'll pause there. Um, I also just want to make a point, um, make one comment that um, please feel free to add questions into the chat. We will be monitoring them. So, and we'll, um, we'll, we'll make time throughout this conversation to answer questions. So we should have said that at the beginning, but I'm um, saying it now. So yeah, drop your questions in the chat by all means and also we're I'm loving thank you for all the hearts and waves and everything it's awesome. yeah. so you know, if you if you like what we're saying like let us know or if you you know drop questions too and we promise we'll answer those towards the end um so yeah so Sarah I mean 900 schools opting in for outdoor learning is huge that's that's half right and um it could have been maybe they were using existing space maybe they were going to request a street closure um they could have been using a park. They could have been partnering with like some other organization for space. Like they, there were options there, but I mean, half chose not to pursue outdoor learning. And in all of the push for advocacy, I think we saw a lot of reasons why, right? So definitely, yeah. Like one, I mean, we already like that the, the date was pushed back, that school was supposed to reopen. It opened later than they thought. They, they missed that first like deadline. It was so hectic trying to figure out how to open schools at all that then adding an additional piece that was new to people was really overwhelming. Um, we also heard so many concerns about weather and the fact that like if schools were reopening in October, how much time do we like actually have to set up all this outdoor infrastructure before we just won't be able to use it anymore? Um, yeah. So that was like a big early push. Um, and, you know, there was examples of like how people were operating in all seasons in like different parts of the U.S., but I feel like that was a very new concept here in New York City, like four seasons outdoor learning. Right. Um, and I think even just off our like very unscientific data, just with partnerships and um, relationships that we have with schools, we know that schools that already had outdoor education programs, this was so much easier for them to do. If they had an existing school garden or they used the outdoors as a classroom prior to the pandemic and their teachers were experienced and comfortable teaching outdoors, it was easier for them to do it. And they also had more resources to do this as well in, in the space to do it or the garden materials or um, all of the other things at a school that this is brand new to may not have had the guidance or the resources to set up an outdoor classroom. And as you said, Kristen, um, you know, the date for reopening kept getting pushed back and principals and school administration administrators were tasked with just like so many logistical considerations for reopening their schools and wanting to make sure that students were safe, that teachers were safe, and that they had all of the protective equipment and all of the materials to set up indoor spaces safely for learning. So it was, um, yeah, it, it was a much bigger lift for schools in, in that situation. There's also, there's a big difference between like if you're, the space you have available is a street closure. There's a big difference between like learning outdoors in a street setup than there is in like an existing garden. So, you know, I think like it was just, like you're saying, it was just a lot, right? But then there were other, there was weather, there was existing infrastructure, there was existing space, there was a space that was available. There was also, like, we heard a lot of concern surrounding, like, safety in existing places. Um, that was one of the, the bigger arguments. And for everybody who was arguing for outdoor learning, I felt like there were 
equally enough people arguing against saying like, well, how do we bring kids outside to learn when gun violence is up or when violence is up generally, or how do we bring kids outside when there could be like traumatic clashes between students and, and police presence in the, in the, in their neighborhood. And so it just looks so different depending on where you are in the city and what you already had set up pre pandemic that launching in, this in the fall was, was huge. Um, and so now I think we're, you know, we're starting to like the weather is warmer, more kids have opted in. Um, I think we're starting to see that garden push. I know we are. It, Sarah, would you say like that you're seeing that as well now that like the weather is warm, there's more push for gardens like in a regular, almost like in a regular year. Definitely. Yeah, I think um, with spring here and things starting to grow, people people are reminded that they can get outdoors and spend time in the garden or in nature or outdoors in general. Absolutely. And there's been, I mean, I think one thing that the pandemic did is that it really heightened people's connection to their outdoor spaces, like whether that's a park in the neighborhood or just a place like everything indoors closed like so our our sense of like neighborhood resources changed a ton and we've seen over the past um year or however <laughs> long it's been at this point like interest in gardening has just like skyrocketed anyway right um but that actually kind of brings to the next point it's like when we're thinking about the resource gap in a regular year when we have schools that are thinking about like starting gardens there are normally tons of like free resources to point them to like I think our nonprofit partners many of the ones that helped us to write this toolkit they always offer something for schools whether that's like free soil or lumber or funding or plants or seeds or seedlings um and sorry I mean you like you see it right like we were usually part of that same network where there's everybody's like almost competing for giveaways in the spring um but this year that really that dry up, you know, I, I, I feel like we don't have that network of resources available anymore because nonprofits like, took such a hit this year. Um, and that's been one of the really frustrating things like in our work is that there's just not those same free resources to direct schools to. And so in that case, you're kind of, they're, they're up to their own devices in many cases to like figure out how to fund this, where to source these materials from. And that's, it's, it's inherently unfair. Um, it, it really is. And I know schools are resourceful and nonprofits are resourceful. And the, the toolkit itself is like is a resource that prioritizes free and existing materials. So, you know, if you don't have seating for outdoors, you can use milk crates, so you can use um, five gallon buckets. But I think um, if we really want to address some of the trauma and some of the social and emotional um, hurt that everyone has been feeling with return and create spaces that are healing and restorative for schools, then we do need more resources to create the types of outdoor, outdoor places that allow us to imagine what education can look like after a pandemic. So completely agree that there's, yeah, there's just, there's no resources available to schools right now. Um, yeah. And that was even like when this was rolled out, I mean, it really was huge that permission was given for this, like the DOE made the permitting process. And I mean, we saw, we saw city agencies like move and work together, like fast, you know, to get this permitting process out there. And I think we all felt it was a huge step forward that it that it happened. But I think the previous chancellor had said at one point, like when in the initial uh, press conference, like announcing outdoor learning that um, when some, when they were asked, like, what resources are available, his response was that more affluent PTAs could fund share with other schools. And that comment took a lot of heat in, the, in the outdoor learning advocacy world, because I, there's no map for how that would happen. And it's again, leaving the resource distribution up to schools or at their own discretion or like requiring that they do their own fundraising and sourcing for this and that is a huge lift like it's putting already a lot on people who are creating a reopening plan in a pandemic and trying to service students like in home and hybrid <laughs> um 
and it just it kind of it, it just continues that inequality that already existed um and so it absolutely reinforces yeah the existing inequities um because we know that those schools that do have affluent PTAs, they would probably um, be able to set up, be able to fundraise or be able to set up spaces for outdoor learning. And um, the the communication and the guidance on that was just not clear at all. And even, even schools or PTAs that wanted to resource share like that, they just didn't understand the, the mechanics of actually doing it. So that was something that we definitely saw a lot of confusion around. Um, because you do, you like, yes, you can be resourceful and set up these spaces for almost no money, but it really does help if you have a tent or you have um, some other some other supplies to make students and staff more comfortable if you want to if you want them to be learning outdoors so that was um, that was clearly a gap um, when they announced this policy I agree with you there and we, we know like so the school gardens program at Girl NYC has been around for 10 years and uh, like over that time we've been fortunate enough to work with research researchers at different like institutions around the city and one of them, like a couple of years ago, did a study for us about like why school gardens succeeded. They looked at 21 successful school gardens and then they looked at like, you know, what made them succeed. And the number one thing was that there was like a support network within the schools. The main reason why they fail is because it's like one person pushing this initiative forward because it's just too much for, for one person to do. And I would say that it's like in that same way, it's almost too much for, like, one school. You kind of need, like, the DOE behind this to, like, make some of those resources available or be make it easier for them to have, like, vendors to purchase supplies through or just supplies available, you know, and, and in the same way that, like, PPE was available for schools and it wasn't left up to, like, individual schools to source that, you know? Um, right. Just, yeah. Yeah. And so many school gardens um, or even just other like sustainability efforts or extracurricular efforts at schools, they really do rely on just the heroic efforts of teachers that already do so much. And so this is always in addition to their teaching load, typically that they may have to also really build support and build a community around a school garden, not to mention take care of the maintenance of a garden, of a, of a living space as well, which is, yeah, which really does require a full team and a lot of, a lot of support within the school community. And that's exactly what we've seen. The most successful school gardens have, have a team of, of people, families, custodial staff, students, teachers that are, that are using the garden and also taking care of it. And so I think a school should really approach the outdoor learning component as a community-based decision as well. So what, what are our goals that we want for, um, for using the outdoors as learning? And then what are our concerns that we can listen to each other as well um, to share all those concerns and then to make a plan together to I agree that, yeah, bringing in, um, having the support, the institutional support of the Department of Education to do that too, in terms of guidance and resources, would be critical for the success of all of, for any outdoor space, especially as we're, you know, looking at, you know, the spring, spring of 2020, like more students coming back to schools, as you mentioned, and then also looking towards the fall too, to what that could what our schools can look like then. Yeah, and I see we have, it looks like we have our first question. Um, oh. It won't be our last one, so please drop them in if you've got them for us. But uh, <laughs> he's asking, could you tell us more about what's in the toolkit? Sure, I can, I can start on that. So <laughs> the toolkit is, um, the toolkit really goes through the steps to setting up an outdoor an outdoor space for learning at a New York City school. So it, it walks you through first, like why you would want to do that, right? So what are the benefits of outdoor learning? And then, um, and then it walks you through sort of selecting a site. So there's a lot of different logistical reasons you would want to select certain sites. So um, 
looking at spaces on your school grounds to set up places for instruction. Or if a school doesn't have that, there's options for closing off streets or for finding, um, for securing permits in parks and community gardens. So after you find a site, the toolkit um, then also just really walks you through some of the the resources and the supplies that you need to set up the space for learning. We really focus on like how to do it and not what to do when you're outside. So yeah, and we really emphasize that, you know, a lot of, um, to most environmental educators, the outdoors is a classroom. So there's an oppor there's a teachable moment or an opportunity to learn wherever you are outdoors. But we were also knowing that um, knowing how safe the outdoors was compared to indoors, we really just prioritize setting up a space so any subject could be taught outside. And we tried to focus on like resources that you could potentially source for free versus like lower cost options or like higher cost if you're able to, um, or if there's something you really need to support the needs of your students. There's um, there's all kinds of different schools can apply for and places where they've historically been able to access free materials as well. Um, ideas for what to do outside from our nonprofit partners because they are doing this, you know, all day, every day in different parts of the city. And there's also like how to's like very practical stuff, like even just how to assess the space that you have to decide if that's where you want to set up outside or, you know, is it worth pursuing one or the other options that's available for space um so there's a lot there's a lot in there and you know it's it's it, i see that uh, it was dropped in the comments so if you're curious yeah. to check it out by all means please do. yeah there's a there's a few case studies for schools that implemented um programs as well in the fall and um and uh, yeah just lists of resources, um, tips for managing classes outdoors, and, and definitely like how you can do it. Um, and knowing that a teacher would, would make the decision of like what to teach outside. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I could talk about this all day. <laughs> but yeah, <fine. laughs> I think there are any other questions in here, unless I'm missing them, but let me see. Um, if you, want, yeah. <laughs> if you um if you're just tuning in this is going to be recorded so if you missed the very beginning you'll be able to watch the whole thing later and you'll also be able to access the toolkit if it's helpful for you it's in the it's in the comments here and um we're going to share our email addresses as well so you can reach out to sarah or myself anytime if this is something that you would like to see more of at your school and we can help you with that or if you're not affiliated with the school at all and you want to just help this initiative, like by all means, you know, we're happy to reach out and, and, and talk to you too. So um, anything garden school related, outdoor learning, like feel free to reach out to me or, or Sarah. Um, so we'll drop our email addresses in the comments. And thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And if, um, you know, and if, if you are part of a school community, or even if you're just part of a community, which we all are, I think these are important conversations to have about thinking about how we can equitably distribute these resources um, so that we can all have a connection to nature or um, a holistic learning experience outdoors. And if you are part of a school community, it's really part of the process for doing this is just visioning what, what it can look like. So. It doesn't have to have to happen this spring, but thinking about going back to school in the fall, like what do you want your child's education experience to look like? How can it, how can the outdoors support their academics instruction as well as their social emotional learning? And um, yeah, so really we just wanna kind of plant the seed and then also really advocate for the equitable distribution of resources so that every school and every child has this opportunity. Exactly. And because for a lot of our kids, this is the only one that they're going to have. You know, the, the school garden is maybe the only garden they'll ever experience as a kid. So um, that was one of the things that like drew me to this work and one of the reasons that I think it's so important. And so there's a lot of different ways to, to work towards that goal of, you know, every student having access to an outdoor learning space, a garden in New York City. So um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so 
thank you, Sarah, for, for talking today and for everything that you, you know, you've done and, and we've done together to like push this initiative forward. And thank you to everybody that's tuning in and thank you to all of our school gardeners and to our, our parents and teachers and administrators and our students um, that make our work <laughs> possible too. So, yes. um, <laughs> thank you, Kristen. Yeah, thanks for having this conversation and thanks to everybody for joining. We really appreciate it. Please reach out if you want to. Clearly, we could talk about outdoor education um, for a long time, and I know both Kristen and I would be happy to. So thank you again. Bye, everyone.